they punched up the door. This is a bit where your blood drains from your face. It's like the prospect of standing up in front of people. Um, so today to talk about uh, DevOps for Joomla. Uh, um, introduction, you think? Um, so I'm I'm Andy. Hi. Uh, and so I'm a, a web developer um, uh, with 20 years experience. I've been using Joomla for about uh, 10 years, and um, and the last few years, I'm mainly doing um, APIs and, and app-related systems. And yeah, it's just um, Andy Gassman on Twitter. Um, so yeah, that is a bit at the beginning when you say like who you are and where, where you're from. So so anyway, just a uh, pop quiz. Can anyone recognise this uh, sun-drenched metropolis? Is that yeah. Hey, <laughs> cool. So. Uh, <laughs> So that bit where you're like, so, so yeah, I, I lived in Croydon for 18 years, well, in South London for 18 years, and, uh, and then uh, Edinburgh for six years, and Australia for a couple of years, and, oh, hey, what about anyone? Anyway, yeah, Glasgow for 10 years, and uh, and I've uh, been living in Aberdeen for like the last eight years. How old are the children? Eight years, yeah, so we stayed up here, next to the hospital, where my wife works. Uh, yeah, let's go to the beach and boats and oil rigs and shit. So uh, yeah, and if you even those places out, um, averaging out by time, the mean location is uh, about 100 miles off Whitby. So I think technically I'm, I'm from here. Should get a boat today. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's good for fishing, you know. So uh, yeah, so um, an introduction. Um, so, so this talk's really based on experience from the last couple of years um, uh, developing, you know, uh, we, the company I work for, we, we develop apps for schools and there's lots of apps for lots of schools. So everything gets, um, uh, it's a scale, scale out as well as scale up. So, and we use Joomla as the back end for the apps, which allows the schools to modify the content on their app. And um, there's an API. And uh, yeah, so we've got, there's like hundreds of Joomla instances, each one controlling a separate mobile phone application. So, so this is really where this has come from in terms of the, the talk is uh, experiences of scaling out, massively scaling out Joomla. Massively? Well, quite largely scaling out Joomla. Uh, and we're, it's just a startup, so there's only a small team. So we kind of end up having to do everything, you know, well, what you do. Um, yeah, so um, <coughs> there's going to be it's a lot of stuff to cover because DevOps is obviously a huge area. So we're going to do DevOps, we're going to do a little bit about continuous integration and continuous deployment, or CD and CI. Uh, so <laughs> continuous integration was really just um, rolling out changes quickly, I guess, or uh, continuously. And continuous deployment would be really about deploying them quickly as well. It's kind of agile things, uh, I suppose. Not really the use the word agile, to be honest. So there's ideas and theory and there's practical examples. Um, yeah. So so this is when people talk about DevOps, uh, it's like uh, development on one side and operations on the other side. Um, in a large team, you would have an operations team and you'd have a development team and like, you might have a QA team and this sort of thing, an architectural team and you know, but it, you, you know, I mean, I, uh, in practice, more people work in small teams, or even you know, just a couple of people, one or two people, and so a lot of things. This used to be this used to be hard, and now this is less hard in practice. Um, and you know, a lot a lot of times the ops side of things traditionally has been done by a hosting company, perhaps, or so it's not really something we've had to think about. But um, and you know, development is normal things like writing code, testing code, and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and. and so this is this would be the cycle of continuous integration, and basically doing this every day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know the main principle is the idea of you, if you the more you automate within the cycle, the quicker you can do stuff. 
whether it's breaking things quickly or fixing things quickly or improving things quickly. Yeah, usually breaking things quickly too. So, uh, so yeah, so all the notes in code based on um, running Joomla on the uh, you know normal le Linux sort of stack. There's examples in GitHub, and just ask any questions. Any time, just button, don't, don't show. <laughs> oh, and there's, there's a big disclaimer. There's loads and loads of stuff in DevOps, so this is a small tip of the tip of the iceberg, really. But, but hopefully, you know, useful scattergun of information and um, practical examples. So, yeah. So, um, so, yeah, automation is really one of the main keys. Uh, for DevOps, because basically, if you do something more than twice, you should just automate it. Because you're probably going to have to do it a third time, and a fourth time, and and it's really boring doing the same thing over and over again. So. And it's much more fun writing the script to do it for you, you know, uh, and then not doing it again. So, uh, so scripting. Uh, he, does anyone have any? Who who likes doing scripting in in Bash? Who likes doing scripting in PHP? Okay, cool, cool. I'm only asking because I slightly adjust the talk. Who likes doing scripting in Node? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not a big JavaScript fan, so I'm probably more inclined for the other two. But yeah. Um, but that's good to get. So yeah, there's some things like in DevOps, uh, kind of handy things to know, to be able to do. You know, like in a general like running server sense, you know, so whether it's like you know, finding that you know, uh, oh, sorry, it's not <laughs> finding big, big, uh, big log files that are more than you know. <laughs> I'm running out of disk space. What are the big things, you know? Um, or um, you know, finding a bit of text in a bunch of PHP files, or or you know, finding a bit of text in PHP or any files. You know, it's just like I don't know. Google it. Find it on Stack Overflow, copy and paste it, and then and then do the same again next time. Um, so this is kind of all on the assumption you've got SSH access to your server, I suppose. But um, yeah. So um, yes, but within automation itself, there's, you've got several options. You know, you could you can script things, you know, in PHP or or Bash or, or JavaScript, or you can run a ta use a task runner like uh, Grunt or Gulp. Um, or you can use like a CI, a continuous integration, continuous deployment system. Sometimes that's a good option if, you, if you've got a larger setup. Or uh, headless browsers is a is a like a Casper JS or or a CodeSet JS. That can be really handy for some sorts of automation. That's easy, you know, where you're just replicating what you're doing. You would do yourself in the browser. So yeah, we'll get started. Uh, so yes, it's a good one for last week because the updates and stuff. Um, so this is quite a new thing uh, using the Joomla command line interface. Um, I only recently started using this to be honest, but it's it's really nice. Um, uh, so in the Joomla projects Git repository, uh, they've got there's an example. I think there's 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 definitely an example of the updating core, and there's a couple of other examples there as well. So. It's really nice in the sense it's you know you just use the PHP and then you just run it on PHP on the command line, and um, I guess it works well for us because it's really built for what we're doing, you know. But but um, you know Brian touched on the idea of running automated updates, and in practice you you know you could use this uh, uh, CLI update Joomla core script, and you could just set up in the cron to run every week or every. Every night, that might be a bit keen, but yeah. And then you, you know, from that point, you'd know that your site's always going to be up to date with you. And equally, uh, there's a uh, for updating extensions too. Um, and it's all very familiar. Really. So you just basically put the CLI PHP file on your on your server and just uh, PHP and then the new file. Works really well. And it's really quick. I used to always do this in cast in the headless browser, but it's much quicker to with the uh, I think uh, Michael uh, Michael Babka wrote, wrote most of that. So. so, so what about your server configuration? Are you 
running it local, or are you running somewhere in the cloud? Or uh, we we um, it's a, it's a good uh, it's a good okay, it's a bit about about okay. that yeah. later on. But um, it's a good good thing to, to mention because one of the reasons why DevOps is is easier in the way that it used to be is uh, you know because of the prevalence of cl cloud service and the simplicity of automation with new sort of newer cloud technologies. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's for you a little bit. Later. But ask me again if I don't really okay. <laughs> answer that properly. Um, yeah. So another option. Um, I'm kind of going through quite quickly, I guess. But that's because there's quite a lot to cover. But if anything doesn't make sense, just give us a shout or or button and say stop rewind. So um, yeah. One thing. Um, so for autom autom automating updates, uh, it can be really handy to, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, updating things is a constant. So uh, whether it's updating based on your own development or, or you know, uh, but we'll look at updating based on your own development at the moment, just in this section. Um, so yeah. Uh, so how many people use Git hook scripts? Okay, cool, okay. And um, let's go. so we're going to talk about using Git hooks, hooks uh, uh, just now. So, so, so Git within with Git hook scripts basically allows you to trigger uh, scripts um, on various uh, Git activities, you'd say, or Git commands, Git commands. Uh, so it's, uh, it works really nicely, and you can you just set up locally sort of thing. Um, and you can, you can. The nice thing about it is you can do piecemeal automation as you go, and it's not like a monolithic task. Um, yeah. So, so uh, the um, if you if you go into your Git working copy, uh, your Git uh, working copy, you'll find there's well, you know, there's a .git folder in there, and inside the .git folder there's a folder called hooks, and um, when you're Local uh, working groups initiated um, the hooks. Hooks directory includes a couple of some example scripts which you can use as a basis um, for creating and developing more Git hooks. So, so yeah. So the, basically, the way Git hooks works is uh, you know there's there's, there's more uh, Git commands that you can use as hooks, but the main ones are things like pre-commit and post-commit. So, um, so basically, when you when you type Git commit dash m, my changes, uh, when that command runs, you know, if you do a pre-commit, if you put a script in a pre-commit uh, directory, uh, if you, if you, well, the, sorry, rewind a little bit. The scripts basically work based on names, so when you, uh, when you, when you commit, um, git will execute the, the script called pre-commit uh, before it commits the changes, and it'll execute the script called post hyphen commit after you've after it's uh, committed the changes. Uh, you know, so so th some things like uh, the post commit you could use for updating file, uploading files, or running automated tests. It works really nicely, really nicely for that sort of thing. So, well, have a few examples. You can also run your your Git hooks on the server, but that's a little harder to to, to set up. Oh, the nice thing is you can if you can have different Git hooks for say for example if you had a, a development uh, branch and a, uh, as opposed to your master you know you could have execute tests in your development uh, on post commit but not on your on your master sort of thing. So, so in a way you're automating the testing process of migrating code through uh, your repositories. Uh, yeah, so this is a really basic, um, really basic example. It doesn't really do anything particularly useful, but it's you know good to start with something to make sure you've got it all working. Uh, so yeah, so this is you know in your in your Git repository, in your Git directory, dot Git directory, you can see there's a hooks directory. And this file is called pre-commit, so this will run before the commit before Git commits as well. So it's not very really exciting really. All it does is. Uh, um, it just appends the date onto the end of the readme file and a list of all the files which is, which are changed. Uh, 
yeah, so basically, every time, you know, you, you could end up with like some sort of like a change log at the bottom of your readme. You know, you can see, uh, so it's you know, outputting Z and this is the readme, uh, echoing the status of the readme, and it's just echoing the space that we a bit time. Um, Minor got you. So you've got to make sure your Git scripts are executable. Um, but that's a given. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, that's, so that's a good starting point. Although it doesn't really do anything particularly useful. <laughs> but um, yeah. So every time, yeah, every time you commit, it'll. Oh. Yeah. So this uh, Yeah. So so the 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 hook script will always execute in the root level of your. Uh, the same directory where the dot git folder is. So, so you know, so this is the assumption that, like GitHub style, you've got a, a readme in the root of your Git repository. Sort of thing. So yeah, well, although the file is sitting in in the sub you know, two subdirectories down, the current working directory is always the top level. But yeah, it's good progress. Um, so moving on to a related topic. Another useful automation tool is uh, Git FTP, uh, which is more joined up in a minute. <laughs> so, uh, so Git FTP is an extension of uh, the Git client, and if you haven't got it on your system already, you can install it via brew or um, apt get apt get install Git FTP. Um, yeah, so um, basically, it allows you to FTP up. Check, you know, well, you, can, your Git client knows what's changed. So it can so in a sense because Git FTP is you know part of your Git client, it can just upload what's changed. So it's a really nice it can work really nicely. So there's a in the same keeps the config the configurations in your normal Git config file and uh, on the server side it puts a, a log file on the server so that when Git FTP connects to the server it knows the the status of the server. So, um, it will work, you know, it's not the only thing that's dependent on on the server side is a uh, is FTP, you know, having FTP access. So even on the most basic hosting, you can you can use this. You know. Does um, it work with SFTP? It it does, although there's a minor. I noticed in some Linux distributions, it would. Uh, yeah, it supports a, a, a all. All the FTP protocols, but I have hit a snag in um, the last version of Ubuntu because it's dependent on on curl, okay. uh, but where curl didn't support S FTP, okay. it would support FTPS and SCP and you know a bunch of other protocols. But yeah, that, that's tripped me up a couple of times. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But um, you can um, you can if you type uh, curl hyphen Help. I think it gives you a list of all the supported protocols that support by uh, by your local version of curl. Um, yeah, that's that's it. Been been, <coughs> been a bit awkward sometimes. But, um, yeah, so it's really easy to set up. Basically, what you what you would do is um, you run you know run these uh, run a bunch of configuration git config commands. So you're at git config and you know, you're putting your your FTP URL and your FTP username. And your FTP password, uh, yeah, and, and the sync route. So that would be like your local path, you know, because you might not want to upload from the top level of your Git working copy, I suppose, you know. And your remote route, that's your the remote path relative to the base. And uh, yeah, so so you, you know, run those five commands, and, and you only do that once, and then set up, uh, and then um, use a uh, Git FTP in it, and that. Uh, you know, well, there's two different routes. If you if you've already got everything uploaded, then you don't need to do Git FTP because that basically uploads everything. But uh, so if you if you haven't uploaded your files already, um, you can use Git FTP in it. But if you uh, if you've already uploaded your files, which is usually the case, you can just use Git FTP catch up, and that basically connects to the server and finds finds out what's on the server and compares that locally and. Uh, and then starts the synchronization, or you know, sets the synchronization status. And then from that point onwards, you just write, you just use a git ftp push, and that will just push all the changes in your local working copy 
to the server uh, via FTP. So, so these are all, these are all one one time only set of things, and the last one is what you probably end up using uh, all the time. So it's really nice because it's, you can just use it as part of your commit workflow. Um, so, and <laughs> looping back around again, uh, this can work really nicely with uh, using a, a Git FTP with a Git hook script. So, uh, say for example you were to use this in a post commit script. So, uh, this, you know, um, you know, this is a similar sort of format, but yeah, the, the uh, file would be called post commit, so that'll execute after your changes have been pushed pushed to the Git repository. Uh, yeah, and basically you end up with a good Git hook script which just basically does this Git FTP push. And then every time you commit, your files will be up, you know, you'll update the server at the same time. So rather than doing two things, you're only doing one. Uh, which is half as many boring, you know, menial, you know, repetitive tasks, I guess. Yeah. Has anyone got any questions or queries about that? Yeah, yeah, totally. So you, um, you would, if you were going to do it that way, um, and you know, which is like a, a, a sensible, normal way to do, you, you basically, you'd end up having a working copy of both branches, and you'd have different hook scripts in each working copy. Um, it can. If you, it can work really nicely just to have the git hook scripts calling other scripts um, because that means because because the git hook scripts sit in the subdirectory of the git the dot git folder you can't really version control them yourself easily you know because they're working out uh, with your working couple but you, you know say for example in your in your in the top level of your repository you could you, could, you know create a directory called automation and um, and you know have that all version controlled nicely with all the rest of your files, and in here you could just have, you know, uh, just pull the automation scripts from the Git hook scripts. So, and this works really nicely, especially if you want to write do your scripting in PHP. You know, you you just end up with this having like a one line, or you can have an executable, a PHP executable here. You, you know, and in practice that would go and execute your up. You know, you end up with like an update server PHP, an update server script, and you know a test. You know, test uh, test system script, and you could just you know call them that way. That's that's you know kind of a nicer way to work. And that way, it's kind of nicer because you'd end up in your in your master branch. You you know you'd have uh, a different set of scripts as opposed to your. Or you could have the same set of scripts, but you know the hooks in one call are different different scripts as opposed to the hooks in the other. You know, you, know, you could even do that dy dynamically, so so that uh, in your script. When it when it executes, it checks checks which branch it's running on, and then runs a different you know a different bunch of logic based on that. You know, so if it's in the master, it just does the update, and if it's in um, if it's not in the master, like your development might be as nice likely to be, then it just you know it runs uh, automated testing and and then does the update or does the update and then automated testing. Uh, yeah, so it can work really nicely. Uh, yeah. The only slight problem is, you know, with the Git FTP, you can only really point the Git FTP at one server, uh, which, you know, if you're wanting to push your updates to multiple servers. But that's, you know, there's, another, there's other solutions for that too. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to touch on automated deployment at the moment, you know, as opposed to just piecemeal updates, like uh, deploying whole sites. Um, yeah, and one of the best, uh, there's a lot of different options for this, um, but my favourite one, to be honest, is uh, Akiba Unity. I meant to ask uh, Nick whether how, how you, you know, the best way to pronounce that, to be honest, in Krakow, but um, I forgot. <laughs> um, yeah, and there's other ways, uh, automating deployment with Docker and Jenkins and Travis and Vagrant, and also with uh, Symlinking too, it can work nicely. Um, yeah, so how many people have used Akiba Unity in the United Okay, cool. So, so that's good. <laughs> so, Akiba Unity is or uh, Unite uh, is basically uh, an extraction utility for JPI, JPA files. How many people use Akiba Backup? Oh, that's kind of everyone. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> so basically, Akiba Unity uh, allows for automation of extracting Akiba Backup files you know, to your server. So, 
it works. It works really nicely. I can't remember whether it's part of the free. I think it, I think it might be part of the subscription part of Akiba, the Akiba suite. But, but it's just a it's just a it's just a sort of standalone script. Uh, so yeah. So what it does is um, it has a it, it's based on XML configuration files to basically tell it what to do, which is fine because you know, it's easy enough to read XML. I mean, you're not getting to that XML YAML, which one's where, so I think it's just a file. Really. But um, it uses a principle of an inbox. So basically, you, you put a bunch of XML files, one per site or JPA file, in, in, a, in a directory called inbox, and then you just run, uh, run it on a command line, PHP, ENP, subdirectory, ENP, PHP. And uh, this is really nice. Like, say, for example, if you want to move 20 sites from one server to another, you could, and you've you just got 20 JPA files. You just uh, create an XML file for each one, or re-duplicate and modify an XML file for each one, and then just click it, kick it, you know, run the script, and it will go and extract each one of those JPA files uh, one at a time. Uh, yeah. So. Um, So the uh, config XML configuration files, they kind of look like this. It's kinda, when you're reading it, you're like, you just tell it the name of the JPA file, uh, name of your log file, name of your site, some you know, general settings that are in your Joomla configuration.php. And uh, there's other bits and bobs like you need to know about your database, um, you know, data, database configuration that's, you know, that it's targeting. And yeah, and, and this uh, uh, site directory as well. So, so if you had ten sites, you'd, you'd end up creating an XML file for each one, and and they're all going to be pretty much the same. The only thing you're probably going to change is the database stuff and, and the site name and the directory stuff. So, uh, so you'd end up with like site one dot XML, site two dot XML, and you know you'd, you'd end up with site one in here, site two in the next one, and so forth. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, site one dot JPA here, and site, uh, yeah. It works, you know, it works really nicely. Uh, so we use this for uh, deploying a couple of dozen Joomla instances every month, I guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So so yeah, the, the process is basically having the JPA, JPA files, and uh, we extract them. So what we what we tend to use is we have a a, a system where Different schools have different uh, uh, kind of uh, different base configurations. So we end up having a JPA file. You know, there's a primary school JPA file and a secondary school um, a secondary school JPA file. And you know, when the sales team are provisioning the apps and Joomla instances, they choose which of these uh, uh, you know which of these categories the site clicks in. And then basically it chooses the appropriate JPA file, which is in a sense just like a vanilla seed for the site. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, so we've we've written a script to automate this where you can call the script and it'll instantiate uh, you know, files give it three parameters and it'll <coughs> then, uh, create create a junior instance based on the, the JPA file. They include all the examples and stuff in a Git, Git, GitHub repository. Uh, yeah, so you can, you know, it's kind of easy. To, uh, this is probably more useful if you're deploying many Joomla sites, I suppose. Has anyone got any queries about Akiba bits before I move on? So I'm just going to really briefly touch on Jenkins and Travis. Um, you know, uh, I did so I did a variation on this talk in in Krakow, uh, so we probably we did more, you know, uh, more developer centric. I guess it was more developer centric content. So um, in terms of deployment, uh, there are lots of options in this whole like uh, in this whole area like Jenkins and Travis and. Um, in a sense, you can do a lot of the same things with Jenkins and Travis. Uh, you tend to use Jenkins and Travis for driving configuration of uh, your automation tasks. 
you can do a lot of this using what, using uh, Git hooks. Uh, in fact, we'll just you know. Um, yeah, there's a whole lot more we could talk about without really time to go. for the sake of time. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, yeah, but another uh, option for quick deployment is a uh, uh, Docker. And uh, I don't know how many people use Docker. Not in Joomla. Oh, yeah, that's cool. But there's some there's some really good uh, uh, Docker containers for Joomla, and um, uh, so I'm not quite sold on Docker for deployment um, at the moment, to be honest, but it's great great, I mean, great for testing and development. Um, so in a sense it allows you to spin up uh, a sort of minimal virtual machine, um, in which is the con it's conceptually it's quite hard to get, because in a sense the, the virtual machine is disposable, and the assumption is you, you wouldn't store any Permanent information on the machine, on the virtual machine, or the Docker instance. So, um, yeah, so so you know, to once you've installed Do Docker, you basically start you basically start a Docker instance uh, with one command, and that will um, basically start a Linux virtu uh, virtual machine container on your on your server. It, it can be really useful for you know testing. So, for example, there's a uh, Docker, uh, Joomla Docker instances for all the different PHP versions. If you if you wanted to quickly test an extension on like six different versions of PHP, probably using Docker is is the simplest way to go. Um, yeah. So your your files your files in practice don't live in Docker. They still live in your virtual in your in your in the host file system. So so you can have one file set and then spin up a container that references it. And then, and then, collapse. Yeah. Yeah. Do they have the hosting companies provide support for that? Yeah, more more now than used to, but but yeah, still kind of feel it's like a more of a development tool than a than a. I think uh, more of the ho I, I think more of the hosting companies. I think because because Docker is still quite new. Quite a lot of the hosting companies started their own like containerized system, containerized offerings before Docker was really. So mainstream, so so in a sense, things like Bitnami is is very much a similar thing, but doesn't use Docker. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So there's lots of Docker, Docker containers uh, available online, both on Joomla's GitHub, uh, Joomla Projects GitHub uh, account, and uh, yeah, so you can try to. And it's it's quite easy to modify Docker container as well. It's just a uh, YAML file um, for all the settings. Um, yeah. And if you want to create your own containers, you can upload them to uh, Docker Hub, which can be useful too. So, yeah, so I'm going to briefly touch on Vagrant. So Vagrant is in a sense a precursor to Docker, and um, it's a less Lightweight virtual virtual machine container. Um, but it offers a lot of uh, the same benefits as Docker, but um, it's more typically used with a persistent file file system within the virtual machine. There's lots of other ways to do this. You can do it with like VirtualBox and this sort of things. I mean, but the real benefit, particularly with Docker, is your you know if you spin up ten virtual machines on your uh, using VirtualBox, for example, you know it's going to be like each one's going to be two gigabytes each. But if you did it with Docker, you know they're only going to be as big as the files you you run in it. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so one thing for Vagrant that's really useful is uh, Joomla tools on their Joomla tools GitHub repository offer a, a great selection of uh, Vagrant instances that you can download and use. Um, and uh, yeah, for different they offer also offer different PHP versions. And there's a few really nice ones which, if you're if you want to spin up a development virtual machine, uh, there's quite a few nice ones which have like all the uh, development packages you you probably typically use like PHP and, and you know uh, Xdebug and 
uh, web growing and stuff. So, you know, if uh, it can be a lot easier to, you know, rather than it's it's more it, you know if you're doing lots of different projects, it can be really useful because you don't you know you don't have to uh, like version you know uh, there's not an issue with your own you know using your own computer as a platform. Your, your you know it's easier to test multiple platforms that way. You know. Whether or not you just want to test your site in Nginx, for example, rather than Apache to see if it works before deploying it. It's the sort of thing you just you can just download an Nginx uh, vagrant container or, or Docker container. Well, there's other things, uh, and then just test it that, you know, if you just want to give it a quick try. Um, there's other ones as well, like uh, Kubernetes as well, which is a Google project. They offer the similar thing. Uh, yeah, so if you're, if you're uh, so Vagrant still uses VirtualBox, but it is a thinner virtualization level. Uh, so yeah, you just uh, initialize your uh, Vagrant box and uh, you can switch it on, and then uh, you can connect it via SSH. And, uh, and you know, use, this is based on the um, Joomla tools, uh, Joomla tools Vagrant. So it's really straightforward, you know, in terms of uh, creating a platform to work on. What does site create actually do? Populates uh, so the yeah, yeah. So, so basically, within the within the Joomla tools uh, Vagrant uh, container, they they they've got they've added a bunch of tools uh, that run within the container. So um, for a lot of common like Joomla related tasks, then. so so basically it will go and create it will create a Joomla instance like a vanilla, you know, download it, create the uh, MySQL using a Create the MySQL database. Just yeah. automate things. Yeah, um, yeah it's just one example. Uh, yeah. So this 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 command is is uh, running on the container itself, and, and this 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 command is basically SSH onto the the operating system. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think generally I. I think I think at the moment I kind of prefer Docker to Vagrant just because it's a bit lighter, and I don't really like VirtualBox is kind of fiddly. So. Um, yeah. Just conscious of time. Um, I'm probably going to done with a bit more editing. <laughs> but um, yeah. So uh, another option for deployment, if you want to deploy multiple instances of Joomla that are Similar or identical, or very, you know, uh, is to use uh, symbolic links. Um, we've been experimenting this, with this lately. Um, so the idea is you, you, do, you create a directory stru structure like this um, with, a parent, you know, with perhaps a directory called parents, which would have uh, the original with uh, Joomla files, and you have a, a directory structure, a uh, directory called children with. Um, uh, Joomla instances that did not contain the files, but instead contained symbolic links from DOM to, say, for example, prod. Uh, this way, it can be nice. It can work nicely. So you can have like a, an alpha file set that you're delivering, and a beta file set, and a production file set, and then you can choose, you know, which sites are derived from which file set. Something so. Um, it can make updates a little bit harder because. Uh, the junior instances that are actually running don't really contain any files, so you end up having to update the parents rather than the children. That's not uh, not not such a big problem. Um, yeah, so we have this uh, example script here for um, creating symbolic link uh, children. Uh, yeah, so so each children, but it, it sort of explains the process really. So. Uh, so this script would go and create create a child based on a parent. So you can see there's a so each child has a database, a MySQL database itself. Uh, so you can see this bit here is creating MySQL database based on what's passed into the, the script. Uh, I think it's creating a username, it's creating a MySQL user, and then it's creating a database for that user. And then and here you can see it's uh, dumping the database from a parent. And then subsequently loading it into the, date, the, the child's database that we just created. Um, yeah. And you can see what it worked 
So there's a bunch of directories that are required. Obviously, things like uh, the images directory and the contempt directory in the cache. Um, so these directories are created. And, um, and, a, and a configuration file. So each child would have its own configuration file, which would point to the database for that child. And um, you see some files are needed. So for example, robots index, index. Uh, so you can see here these are copied from the parent and the source parent into the child, uh, child directory. And, um, and then, you know, basically it creates a bunch of symbolic links. So these are soft, soft links. So, so it's, it's linking, it's creating a directory, uh, it's creating a symbolic link to the directory of the parent that that child is associated with. Um, yeah. You know, so in this use case, each Joomla instance is so. If you, so, if you had ten Joomla sites, and uh, and you had ten full Joomla installs, you'd end up with uh, 30, uh, forty thousand files. You know, nearly all of which would be duplicated because uh, they're all the same <laughs> Joomla. Um, but using this instance, you you'd end up with only. You know, four thousand files. I don't know how many files in June at the moment, but like that's you know, so it's really good for de for deduplicating your set. Um, yeah, so anyway, anyway, this is a this is a little esoteric approach perhaps, but has anyone got any questions now? Yeah. So so once you once you've got this set up with parents and children, then you can you can switch a uh, a child from referencing one parent to another something. So again, there's another script here. All these are in the examples directory on GitHub. So um, so basically this this script would, you, you know, you could have a Joomla instance or a symbolically linked Joomla instance that was pointing to a, a, beta, a beta file set and then you want to switch it to an alpha file set. You would just run this script passing in uh, the, parameter, the parent parameter and the child parameter. And that way, it basically just going to update all the symbolic links to point to the different parents. So, that makes sense. Um, so, so in some ways, it's really nice for updating live, live, um, you know, sites that are running constant uh, live because, you know, if you were going to update a live site uh, by copying or updating, uploading files, there's uh, obviously a latent a lag while the files are all being uploaded and updated. But because this isn't actually moving any files at all, it's just modifying symbolic links. Um, it runs in two seconds, or thereabouts. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you know, so you, it would allow you to really quickly switch the site from being in, like a uh, beta to a live. Or that's it. Let's get the setup up front. So, which is the time? Um, another great thing for automation. Do you have any questions about the symbolic link uh, directories and okay. Come and get me afterwards if you. Uh, another great automation option is uh, headless browsers, which I'm going to talk about really quickly. <laughs> um, so, so headless browsers have been around for a long time, and you know, mostly people are probably most uh, familiar with uh, Selenium, um, but but more recently, there's there's probably Better and e better options uh, that are easier to use options. Um, so, so yeah. Uh, so the idea of a concept of a headless browser is just in a sense you're pretending to be a person using a browser. Um, so uh, Selenium runs uh, the brow uh, Java runs a runs a browser on a Java virtual machine, I think, and you basically control what it clicks. Some of the newer ones like Phantom JS and Nightmare. And these other ones, which uh, say, uh, say for example, Casper JS basically uses Phantom JS in the background, so there's a lot of overlap between us. And the Codecept JS is, is uh, um, developed by the same team as Codeception. So if you're used to using Codeception, you you'll be quite comfy with Codeception. And generally, these things seem to get easier and easier. Like Phantom, I was using that four years ago. It's kind of a nightmare to use. And then, and then I moved to Casper when that came out. It's much easier to write the, the scripts. And uh, and more recently we moved to Codecept because it's really you know it's just right using Codeception. Um, 
Yeah, so Casper.js is probably the easiest one to get started with. Um, so you end up with it, it's all written in JavaScript, which could please the <laughs> JavaScript friends. But uh, yeah, so you, you just write the script like this. This, uh, this example just logs into Joomla and updates Joomla, which is an automation, an automation task in itself. So you can see you set, you know, you set the viewport this way. Um, it would be the size of the browser window. And you know, there's a bit of arbitrary, you can see, you can put echoes and you know, it's just, if you're used to Node, it's a, a system you'd be comfortable with. And you can, uh, you can pass, in, pass in parameters, domain using the password, and then it'll, um, this is a, uh, you know, it'll log into the administrator part of that site, filling in the form for you with the username and password that you passed in. And um, you can, it's really easy to capture screen grabs too. And uh, yeah, you just control it using the DOM, like this sort of thing. So here we've got, uh, it looks at the footer of the admin section and it sees whether or not it's the current version. And if it is the, and if it is the, if it's not the current version, it goes and, uh, does, yeah, it basically goes and clicks the purge button. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Clicks, and then clicks the update button, and then it's you know it's much nicer to use the Joomla CLI now because there's other things like here. You, you know, once it's clicked the button, you've got to wait an arbitrary amount of time before you go and do something else. But yeah, you can see the syntax is not particularly elegant in the sense, isn't? Yeah, yeah. Um, which is a good exa good reason to briefly the last thing we look at is a uh, look at Coset JS. So this is a uh, uh, like business logic. What's that like no, design driven test? Jerky. Yeah. But uh, in this case, it's yeah. So so basically, using Coset, you can see the logic. You, you basically write what you write what you're doing. It's kind of nice. So this is a, this script does exactly the same as the previous one, and. Um, you know, you go to the administrator part and fill out fields, I fill fields. It's very like, it says what it does. I click login. You can see, uh, you know, it does the screen grabs as well. Um, and then clicks. Yeah. Someone, yeah, yeah. Clicks. Uh, Yeah, it clicks the install the update button here, and a bunch of screenshots. I mean, these both both Coset, Coset JS, and Casper JS, you can use really nicely in a Git. You could use in a uh, Git, a GitHub post commit script, where even on a very basic level, you could have your execute uh, a script, which just goes goes to your site and takes a screen grab of the home page, you know, and then, and you could even have that so it, you know automate that so it diffs. That screen grab of the home page we wanted to previously, and you can, you can use that as a quick way to, and then you know slowly build out more and more tests, for testing more and more features of your system. Uh, yeah, and and the code section output, code set JS output is pretty much looks like this, and it doesn't really, you end up with like green ticks and red X's and you know, it tells you it passed. So yeah, I think I was going to touch on monitoring a little bit <laughs> and uh, things. But I'll skip over a bunch of things. Has anyone got any questions? I know we can get questions on one. Um, about the automatic fill-in with uh, the mm -hmm. passwords, mm -hmm. uh, where do I start being a non-programmer SEO with no clue? Because I thought it's, it would be a very nice way to test whether forms are working mm -hmm. in an automated way. Yeah, yeah. So what do I need to set that up? So um, to, it's, it's a really good example. I know uh, I've got people who, people who have the same, you know, use the same sort of thing, just test weekly that forms are working. Because yeah. obviously that's like, if your call to action is failing, then yeah. Like, um, yeah, so for the easy, probably the, the easiest starting point for that is that's probably with Casper JS. Um, so you just um, if you if you're running uh, on Linux, um, 
for what's the Microsoft? Uh, if you're running on Linux, you can just install it with like app get install Casper James. Okay. Uh, that's fine. And the same with Brew. I don't use Brew, but I think Brew kind of works on on either um, OS X. And what's the? Uh, there's a new Microsoft one called. Is it called Chocolate? Or the, yeah, which I and I think, as I understand it, if you're using Windows, you can pretty much use. The brew come up. The command you use in brew in in chocolate. It's cho I think ch chocolate is Microsoft's version of brew, like a uh, package management system for open source. And so yeah, I, I have a tinker with that. And you know, um, and the Casper JS uh, website, it's all open source. Anyway, so, but they've got lots of really good examples. You know, um, example scripts for like uh, doing Google searches, for example, or um, you know that sort of thing, or logging into your Yahoo email. It's you know off the shelf. Off, yeah, in the examples directly over here. There's loads of stuff you can start with. So. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you. I don't know whether it'd be good for qu like querying Google search results and that sort of thing, you know, in terms of. Yeah, they, they make that very, very difficult. So if they see a lot of queries, they'll give you captchas. And, yeah, 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 gotcha. uh, but, you know, you could, you, could, you could use it every day for grabbing whether you're the number one in the search results yeah. or something, yeah. based on the talk you did. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, and you could have it so it emailed you with a screen grab of the search oh, yeah. results for your key terms. Or something. Nice. Um, any other questions? Or queries? Yeah, so we were taking a lot of screenshots with the Casper JS and all Yeah, yeah. So how do you compare Yeah, see, I mean, it can work really, work really nicely for some. If you if your site's got static content, you can um, you could use that like for an automated. Say static content or elements of your site where there are st the, the content is more static. You could use um, something like that with a Git hook script, and uh, you just have it so it outputs the screen grabs into a directory, um, and then and you could even version control your screen grabs with Git and use a you know a Git status to see whether the, the image has changed from one view to the next. You know, it's not it's not going to work on you know if you've got the like, constantly changing content like. The images are always going to be different, but say for a contact form is a good example because you, you know, unless there's like changing side elements, like if you had like latest news on the side, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna be different every time. But, but um, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. So you could you could use like a use your usual version control for tools to to diff, you know, diff this week's test with last week's test, for example. That would be nice, and you could do that. In a sense, you could you could. Have that so in in practice it could be like unattended unless unless there's a difference and then you go so it's it's really you know some of that sort of automation is not like kind of, that's what we tend to do a lot it's not really proper automated testing but it's more like uh, using the testing automatically to flag whether or not then it needs human you know human inspection or you know <laughs> you know uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, but catch me afterwards anytime or, or ask me on Twitter. Uh, there's a GitHub, GitHub repository, it's just Andy Gaskell, github.com slash Andy Gaskell, and then I think that the repository at the top of the list is the, the one for this talk. It's got all the slides and it's got examples in as well. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, GitHub, Andy Gaskell, and this is a repository name, but um, ask me anything anytime. Um, I'd like to say a big thanks to uh, Ron. Oh, oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, cool. So I'd like to say big thanks to Ron and team for everything organising everything today, and, uh, and uh, that's it. Yeah, cool. Thanks. <laughs> and breathe.